News of the Times Wicked Wednesdays Cases of Hand of God Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we take a look at two stories involving what was called Hand of God or Act of God. The two cases, one reflecting a case of God's intervention and another with a representative of the church, are murky opposites of each other. Our first story of 1650 was a very famous case in its day. Anne Green, a 22-year-old servant in the household of Sir Thomas Reed, finds herself pregnant under the unwanted insistence of the grandson. What is deemed a case of infanticide, sadly not so uncommon in 1650, becomes a story of the miraculous. A big thank you to one of our long-term subscribers for suggesting this. Our second story from 1860 is the darker side of a similar theme. The Reverend Bonwell, passing himself off as a widower, seduces the daughter of a clergyman whilst on holiday in Margate. The unfortunate girl becomes pregnant. Thrown out of her home, she tracks down the errant reverend in London, where she gives birth to a child. Things do not go well. Two stories of the hand of God, one of redemption and one not, is today's episode of Wicked Wednesdays. We hope you enjoy the show. The case of Anne Green, 1650. Medical knowledge pre-Victorian times could be quite poor. One real example of this was in the case of miscarriages. This was not well understood, and it was difficult at the time to assess whether the death of a newborn had been an act of God, miscarriage, or something more sinister. On a different note, our regular listeners will know executions did not always run as planned. Where the prisoner survived their execution was called an act of God, with the belief that the person had been saved from definite death by the interference from God, who insisted that the person lived. One case which encompasses these two concepts of act of God and hand of God cases is the famous Anne Green story from 1650. Anne Green in 1650, aged about 22 years, was in the service to Sir Thomas Reed in Oxfordshire. She testified that she had been seduced and ruined by Sir Thomas's grandson, Geoffrey. She became pregnant, but testified that she didn't know she had been pregnant. One of her co-workers confronted that Anne had had some female issues prior to what would have been the pregnancy date. So Anne believed at the time that it was just a continuation of her female issues. Anne did not report the grandson or make any complaint. Instead, she got on with it and com continued working in the same household, her slowly swelling belly covered by the clothes of the day. Approximately 17 weeks later, Anne went into labour while stirring a vat of malt. She miscarried her child alone, in the lavatory, known as the House of Office. Not knowing what to do, Anne buried the lump of flesh, as it was referred to by the midwife, later testifying near a cesspit by the house. The corpse was discovered and reported to Sir Thomas Reed. Magistrates were called in, and Anne went to trial. From the news 
From the Dead, 1651, a true and miraculous narration of the miraculous deliverance of Anne Green. Here happened lately in this city a very rare and remarkable accident, which, being variously and falsely reported amongst the vulgar, as is in such cases it is usual, to the end that none may be deceived, and that to signal an act of God's mercy and providence may never be forgotten. I have here faithfully recorded it, according to the information I have received from those who were the chief instruments in bringing this great work to perfection. In the house of Sir Thomas Reed in Oxfordshire, there lived a maid named Anne Green, born at Steeple Barton in the same county, being about twenty-two years of age, of a middle stature, strong, and of indifferent good features, who, being as she said, often solicited by fair and by false promises and other amorous enticements of Mr. Geoffrey Reed, grandchild to the said Sir Thomas, a youth of about sixteen or seventeen years of age, but of a forward growth and stature, at last contented to satisfy his unlawful pleasure, by which act, as it afterward appeared, she conceived and was deli delivered of a man-child, which, being never made known, and the infant found dead in the house of office, the lavatory, caused a suspicion that she, being the mother, had murdered it and thrown it there on purpose to conceal both it and her shame together. The Trial and Execution Thereupon she was immediately taken into examination and carried before several justices of the peace in the country, and soon after, in an extreme cold and rainy day, sent unto Oxford Jail, where, having passed about three weeks more in continual affright, in a place as comfortless as her condition. She was at a sessions held in Oxford, arraigned and condemned, and on Saturday the 14th of December last, brought forth to the place of execution where, after the singing of a psalm and something said in justification of herself as to the fact for which she was to suffer, and touching upon the lewdness of the family wherein she lately lived, she was turned off the ladder hanging by the neck for the space of almost half an hour. At the execution, Anne's friends attempt to hasten her death and minimise her suffering, some of her friends in the meantime thumping her on the breast, others hanging with all their weight upon her legs, sometimes lifting her up and pulling her down again with a sudden jerk, thereby the sooner to dispatch her from her pain. The under-sheriff, fearing that she should break the rope, forbade them to do so any longer. At length, when everybody thought she was dead, the body being taken down and put into a coffin, and it was carried thence into a private house, where some physicians had been appointed to make a dissection. The recovery. The coffin being opened, she was observed to breathe. A lusty fellow that stood by, he thinking to do an act of charity in ridding her of the final relics of a painful life, stamped several times on her breast and stomach with all the force he could. Then, perceiving some life in her as well for humanity as their profession's sake fell presently to act in order for her recovery. First having caused her to be held up in the coffin, they wrenched open her teeth and powered into her mouth some hot and cordial spirits, 
whereupon she wrestled more than before and seemed obscurely to cough. Then they opened her hands, all fingers also being slightly bent, and ordered some to rub it and chafe the extreme parts of her body, which they continued to do for about a quarter of an hour, often in the meantime powering in a spoonful or two of the cordial waters, and besides tickling her throat with a feather at which she opened her eyes but shut them again. As soon as they perceived any heat in her extreme parts, they thought of letting her blood, and no sooner was her arm bound for that purpose, but she suddenly bent it as if she had been contracted by a fit of the convulsion. The vein being opened, she bled about five ounces, and that so freely that it could not easily be stopped. The medical testimony is extensive on how the doctors helped to revive her. Her blood is let several times, up to nine ounces in one sitting. Given the many practices she undergoes, it is doubly surprising that she survived. Anne suffers from extreme pain in her throat and sides. It is recounted that her face begins to swell, and one side of her face is black with bruising. She runs a fever for several days, which eventually subsides. But Anne does recover and is eventually able to talk and walk about. Within the trial, Anne had testified to her being forced upon by the grandson, and that she herself did not know that she was pregnant, and her not realising that the corpse that was expelled from her body was actually a baby. Anne's survival is considered miraculous, and a portent from God that Anne should live. From the News from the Dead, 1651, a true and miraculous narration of the miraculous deliverance of Anne Green. And now, being able to walk about the town, eat, drink and sleep as before this accident had befallen her, she had liberty to repair unto her friends in the country, taking away with her the coffin wherein she lay as a trophy of this her wonderful preservation. Thus, within the space of a month, was she wholly recovered, and in the same room where her body was to have been dissected for the satisfaction of a few, she became a great wonder, being revived to the satisfaction of multitudes, that flocked there daily to see her. After a few days, the governor, coming himself to see her, did not only contribute to her in a liberal manner, but also improved his charity with many pertinent and wholesome instructions. By this means there was gathered for her to the sum of many pounds, whereby not only the apothecary's bill and other bills for her diet and lodging were discharged, but some other plus remained towards the suing of her pardon. Stories are collected and recounted of more evidence in support of her innocence. From the News from the Dead, 1651, a true and miraculous narration of the miraculous deliverance of Anne Green. The child. The child was abortive or stillborn and consequently not capable of being murdered. She did not certainly know that she was with child, and it fell from her unawares as she was in the house of office in the lavatory. It is evident that the child was very imperfect, being not above a span in length and the sex hardly to be distinguished, so that it rather seemed a lump of flesh than a well and duly formed infant. The midwife said also 
that it had no hair and that she did not believe that it ever it had life. Besides, her fellow servants do testify that she, Anne, had certain issues for about a month before her miscarriage, which were of that nature as are not consistent with a vitality of a child. It is not likely that the child was vital, the mischance happening not above seventeen weeks after the time of her conception. The Death of Sir Thomas Reed There is yet one more thing which has been taken notice of by some as to the maid's defence, that her grand prosecutor, Sir Thomas Reed, died within three days after her execution, even almost as soon as the probability of her reviving could be well confirmed to him. But because he was an old man, and such events are not too rashly to be commented on, I shall not make use of that observation. Anne, mostly recovered, becomes a celebrity of her time. She is fully pardoned, with all charges against her expunged. Anne eventually marries and has three children. She died in childbirth, aged 37. From 1650 we jump to 1860 and the disgraceful case at Stepney. The Reverend James Bonwell, a curate at St Philip's Stepney for 15 years, is charged with the surreptitious disposal of the body of a dead infant. Interestingly, the Reverend Mr. Bonwell is indirectly in the news in 1859, almost one year before the scandal he finds himself immersed in, with a case against a Scotsman who loudly preaches outside his church and who places placards emphasising his points against the outside railing of the church. The Scotsman's main preaching was regarding the sin of infidelity. The Reverend Bonwell is called forth to trial regarding the Scotsman's interference with the church services. The beginnings of the scandal commence in 1859. It would appear that as a married man, the Reverend Bonwell embarked on a courtship with Lizzie Yorath, the daughter of a clergyman whom he encountered during a seaside retreat in Margate. The duplicitous clergyman proposed to Lizzie, and she consented to act as his wife. Lizzie duly becomes pregnant. Her brother, who has found the Reverend Bonwell suspicious, discovered too late that he was a married man. As her pregnancy becomes known, Lizzie is thrown out of her home. She traces Bonwell back to London. Bonwell hides her away in the room conjoining the chapel. Here she gives birth to a male child. Her presence and the birth of a child are all kept secret. The newborn child has difficulty swallowing and becomes sickly rapidly. A doctor is called in, and although given that all treatment must be kept quiet and hidden, it is questionable the quality of the doctor brought in. The child dies within three weeks. Using his influence and the full weight of his clergy role, Bonwell convinces the undertaker to hide the dead child's corpse in the same coffin as a newly deceased woman's coffin. All of this is left hidden until an anonymous letter is sent to the Bishop of London retelling the whole sad affair. An exhumation is ordered where the shocking discovery is uncovered. 
From the Bath Chronicle and Weekly Gazette, the 22nd of September, 1859. Extraordinary Inquest. Extraordinary inquest. On Saturday afternoon, an exceedingly delicate investigation was begun before Mr. Humphrey, the coroner, and a highly respectable jury at the New Globe Tavern, Mile End Road, to discover the causes which led to the death of a male child aged three weeks, whose body has been exhumed by order of the coroner acting under instructions from the Secretary of State. It appears that early in August last, the Bishop of London received two letters signed a parishioner, which alleged that the Reverend J. Bonwell, rector of St. Philip's Church in Stepney, had placed a young lady in an apartment in the schoolhouse adjoining the church, and that she there became a mother on the 11th of August last. It is also stated that the mother and child had suddenly left the house, given to rise to suspicions of foul play regarding the infant. The Bishop of London, on receipt of these letters, placed the matters before the authorities of Scotland Yard, who immediately commissioned Inspector Witcher to investigate the truth or falsehood of the letters. From the inquiries which he made, Inspector Witcher ascertained that the rector was a married man, and that when introduced to the young lady in question, he represented himself to be a widower. She subsequently left her home and lived with the rector Bonwell. They were afterwards traced to London and had been seen to enter the schoolhouse at Stepney on the night of the 11th of August last. The child was born there, Dr. Godfrey of Finsbury Square attending, and a nurse was procured for the mother. On the 15th of the same month, the mother and child removed to the Sussex Hotel, Duke Street in Southwark, where the rector engaged apartments for her. On Saturday the 3rd of September, the child died, and the same day the Reverend Mr. Bonwell called on Mr. Ayres, an undertaker, and presented him with a certificate of the child's death and bade him bury the child as quickly as possible, paying him eighteen shillings for his trouble. The child was buried not in a separate coffin, but was surreptitiously placed in the coffin of an adult named Elizabeth Haycock, whose funeral Mr. Ayres performed on the 4th of September at the Tower Hamlets Cemetery. On these facts being communicated to the coroner, the body of Elizabeth Haycock was exhumed, and the body of the deceased child was found lying within the same coffin. After the examination of the secretary of the cemetery and one or two witnesses, the inquest was adjourned until next Wednesday, in order to collect the necessary witnesses and to await the result of analysis of the intestines and stomach of the deceased child, which have been forwarded to Dr. Leatherby for that purpose. The examination does show that the child had imperfectly formed lungs and the death of the child was an act of God rather than anything more sinister. However, the Reverend Bonwell's illicit intimacy whilst married to a young girl under the pretense of marriage, followed by the burial of the child, all fall under the legalities of the Archer's Court, the legal tribunal of the Church of England. From the Shepton Mallet Journal, the 15th of June, 1860, the Reverend James Bonwell. This extraordinary case, which has been so long before the public and in which the Reverend James Bonwell, rector 
of St. Philip's in Stepney is put on his defence on account of grave charges of immorality came under the judicial cognizance of the Dean of the Court of Arches on Wednesday morning. The reverend gentleman, having been admonished to attend and either admit the articles exhibited against him or give notice that she, he should oppose their admission. Sir John Harding, the Queen's advocate, represented the Bishop of London, and opening the proceedings said that this was proceeding under the Church Discipline Act and was taken for benefit of Mr Bonwell's soul's health. Upwards of twenty other articles followed, which affirmed that the reverend gentleman made the acquaintance of Miss Yorath at Margate in September 1858, and that while there he systematically represented himself to her and her friends as an unmarried man, he being married and having a wife alive at the time. They alleged also that Mr. Bonwell and Miss Yorath met afterwards in London, and that he harboured her in the schoolroom connected with his church, where she gave birth to a male child, which afterwards died and was buried. They then gave in detail the various acts of intimacy alleged to have taken place between Mr. Bonwell and Miss Yorath in London and various parts of the country. They also set forth the facts connected with the birth of the child, Philip Yorath. They urged Mr. Bonwell's connection with the birth, alleging that he engaged his medical man, Dr. Godfrey, to attend to the confinement, made arrangements for the hiring of the nurse, privately baptised the child, and gave instructions to an undertaker to bury the child when it died. The last article was the usual formal one, and the Reverend James Bonwell, priest of the United Church of England and Ireland law, was therefore liable to punishment for infraction of its laws. Reverend Bonwell argues that the harbouring of Miss Yorath was not an ecclesiastical crime, rather it was his Christian duty to help unfortunates. As for the now dead child, Philip Yorath, he argued there was no proof that he was the father. If anything, he describes himself as having been seduced by the young Miss Yorath, not that he seduced her. Unbelievably, Bronwell only received a severe reprimand by the ecclesiastical court. There was a huge outcry from the public and the press, as it was proven that Bronwell had committed the gravest of offences with seduction and adultery. His case is brought back to court with a final decision in July 1861 by the final appeals court that Mr. Bonwell's ministrations would be an offence and scandal, even his presence would be shocking. There were cheers from the public when Bonwell, within the courtroom and court of appeals, upheld the ruling that Bonwell would be deprived of his benefices, meaning that he was to be permanently removed in his position from St. Philip's Church in Stepney. From here, Bonwell vanishes and no more is heard of him. That concludes this episode of Wicked Wednesdays, Hand of God Stories. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, we would be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our channel. We are passionate about historical crime and do our best to present interesting cases from long ago that go beyond the usual fare. For our listeners and subscribers, thank you. We so very much appreciate the many supporters and subscribers who have helped us 
to build this channel. The News of the Times team all appreciate each of you for your help. We upload four days a week. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time spans of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Mondays are murderous where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Wednesdays are wicked where we pull together stories of a similar theme such as stories of murders by starvation. And Fridays are frightful, with stories that are grouped by geographic location, allowing us to share lesser-known, grisly crime stories. From all of us at the News of the Times team, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.